All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Today I'm in this 2014 Mercedes GLA, which is a bit of an odd car. I think it was thought up by a committee. Traditionally, the Mercedes lineup was pretty straightforward. You had the C-Class, the E-Class, the S-Class, small, medium, large. Then they decided to make a 4x4, hence the ML, which is now called the GLE. Then they've decided to make a bigger 4x4, hence the GL, which is now called the GLS. Then they decided to make a smaller 4x4, hence the GLK, or now the GLB. Then they realised they were missing out on sales to the Golf, so they decided to create the A-Class, which is now a car that's bought exclusively by PTs and MUAs. Then they decided the A-Class was too small, so along came the Mercedes B-Class, which is now popular with people who watch Countdown. For any other company, that would have been a wide enough model range, but not Mercedes. They went one step further. They threw caution to the wind and decided to make a car suitable for every single man, woman and child on the planet. So here we have the GLA, which is basically just a jacked up A-Class. I think it's been designed for somebody who likes the A-Class, but has a bad back, possibly has a dog, and lives up a dirt track, so they need a four-wheel drive car, but they don't want the high running costs of a Range Rover. As an idea, as a concept, it's a bit niche, isn't it? Then what I think happened next was, they must have thought, hang on, if we make a high-riding small SUV, it will inevitably become a bit of an OAP magnet. So we've got to make it still a bit more youthful and a bit more appealing to a younger audience. So, I know, we'll give it red seat belts, a blingy grill, big diamond cut wheels, and a sporty dual clutch transmission. It's all a bit strange, don't you think? I mean, that's obviously only my opinion. So let's get down to some facts. The GLA has been around since 2014 and it ran for about five years before the second generation came out earlier this year. Some are available with the Formatic four-wheel drive system, but most aren't, but this one is. Under the bonnet of this one is the 2.1 litre four-cylinder turbo diesel engine, which produces 170 horsepower. It's the same engine that was used in the Infiniti that I filmed with recently. And it's a good engine, it's, it's never gonna win any prizes unless the competition includes a, a decibel meter because it can be a little bit loud. The engines themselves are as tough as old boots, but they are showing their age a little bit. They're just a little bit coarse and unrefined. They also offered the GLA with a range of petrol engines to satisfy Sadiq Khan, and they made the quite mad GLA 45 AMG, which satisfied nobody. I think they thought there would be some demand for a, a semi-high-riding, small, compact, jacked-up A-Class with a two-litre turbo engine, which produced about 350 horsepower or whatever it was. Obviously there wasn't any demand for that because I can't honestly recall ever seeing a GLA 45 on the road. If you do opt for this diesel, it'll do 40 miles per gallon around town, up to 60 miles per gallon on a motorway run. It only costs 150 pounds a year to tax here in the UK, so it's quite frugal. One of my gripes so far with the GLA is this DCT transmission. As with all DCTs, when you get a move on, the changes are really quick but around town it's just easily confused. It starts stop traffic, it becomes a bit of a pain in the neck. And occasionally, like just then, when I, when I approached a roundabout, you put your foot down, it doesn't know which gear to give you, so it just hesitates. Whereas a standard old-fashioned automatic wouldn't have done that. It rides quite well, there's not much wind or road noise. The ride is a little bit on the firm side, but it's not uncomfortable. The boot is a little bit bigger than you'd find in an A-Class, but not massively. In fact, if you want the exact figure, it's 140 litres bigger. Always confused me why they measure boot space in litres. Why not quantify it in something that we actually could relate to? Like, how many bags for life can you fit in there? Or how many shoe boxes can you fit? Or how many, I don't know, how many apples even? It'd be more handy to, or easier to get my head around than litres. Rear leg room isn't noticeably better than the A-Class either, although you do get more headroom, which I suppose is handy if you often take passengers to the Grand National, but is that really necessary every day? As I mentioned earlier, this is the Formatic four-wheel drive version, but the ground clearance isn't brilliant, so don't expect it to be as good or capable off-road as a Range Rover Evoque, because it won't be. I think the interior is very nice, though. It's really stylish. I like modern Merc interiors. I think they do a good job. You get all this brushed aluminium here, or aluminum if you live in the States. The steering wheel feels nice and chunky. Everything feels upmarket and premium. You get a couple of cup holders here. You get plenty of storage compartments for my wallet and phone and keys and things. You get storage compartments in the door pockets. This is quite a good spec, actually. This one's got more, more toys than Richie Rich. And you've got memory seats, heated seats. You've got blind spot monitoring things on the wing mirrors. They all come with this floating infotainment screen here, which I like. I know some people think it looks like a bolted on iPad, which I suppose it does, but I quite like that. I also like the design of the fans here. You see that on all new Mercedes. I think it looks really cool. I also like the fact that on the automatic versions, the automatic gear lever is up here, column mounted, which just frees up this area down here. I like the sporty red stitching and red seat belts that you get on the AMG line. 
it feels like you're in something much sportier than you actually are. There are a few areas of cheap plastic trim though, such as the, the covers on these two storage compartments. They feel a little bit cheap and flimsy and they creak a little bit. But that's pretty much it because everything else feels pretty well built to drive. I mean, they're all very similar, these kind of cars. I've got a 2.1 litre diesel engine under the bonnet, so don't expect blistering performance, but it's all right. The steering's a little bit on the light side, but just makes it easy to drive, easy to park. There's not much body roll. The visibility is all right because you sat a little bit higher up. Yeah, it's just all right, I suppose. I don't think you'd ever be itching to drive it, but there's nothing wrong with it either. If you put your foot down, it's, it's quick enough, I suppose, to get you out of trouble. It's never thrilling or exciting, but then you wouldn't expect it to be. Now, styling-wise, I'm not convinced. I think it looks all right from the side and the front, but the back is just ugly. It just looks like a high-riding hatchback rather than some sort of rough and tumble off roader. So no, it's not really for me, but then each to their own, I suppose. You see enough of them on the road, so they're obviously quite popular. Instead of a GLA, you could buy a Audi Q2 or a BMW X1 or X2 or a VW T-Roc. They're all about the same really, aren't they? It's a segment of cars that are obviously popular because people buy them, but it's a segment that I don't think anybody needed or asked for. I just don't understand them personally, but that's not to say they're bad cars inherently. You can pick up used early example GLAs, low spec with high miles, for about £12,000. For one like this with only 39,000 miles on the clock, good service records and loads of optional extras, that will set you back around £17,000. And I'm sorry, but for 17 grand, I'd rather have a Range Rover Evoque. As a new car or a new purchase, the GLA, well, the new shaped GLA now, are quite expensive, especially if you spec it with all the toys that this one has. Quite often with Mercedes, I know with the A-Class in particular, there are loads of decent PCP and lease deals. So that would make it a little bit more affordable to get around the wheel of. Reliability-wise, the reports that I've read are favorable. The engine is pretty much bulletproof. It's tried and tested. Just keep it with your service in and you shouldn't have any issues. I would keep one eye on the DCT gearbox though, because, well, if it's anything like a DSG, it will want its fluid changing every 40 or 50 or 60,000 miles. But again, find yourself a decent Merck specialist like SPR in Stockport, and you shouldn't have a heart attack when you get a bill. Overall then, it's a fairly high quality car. It's built well, it drives well enough, it's cheap enough to run. I just don't get it. I don't see the appeal. Then again, if you have a bad back and a Labradoodle and live at the top of a dirt road, this might be all the car you ever need. I just think the GLA is like a people pleaser. By trying to keep everybody happy, it actually satisfies no one. So thanks once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. If you've got any comments or questions, let me know and I'll do my best to get back to you. So yeah, cheers guys. I'll see you next time.